What's going on everyone? Just heading home from the clinic today and I wanted to cover a case that we saw today, which we see often. And, and, this is like Technique, technique Thursday. You know, everyone does Technique Tuesday. Well, it's Thursday and I want to cover something about technique or systems of the thought process of how you think about these really common complaints that a patient presents with. And I'll tell you in the past when someone said this, I didn't have a whole lot for them because, you know, you, well, I'll get into it here in a second. But first, real quick, if you're wondering how to find out more information, not just about the clinical end of looking at corrective exercise, functional movement, how the, the movement, the posture component fit into the segmental chiropractic component of what we all do as chiropractors, check out the site movableuniversity.com. And there's really three ways that you can get going with this. One is you grab the book for free, which we printed a bunch of copies. You cover shipping, you get the book for free, we'll send it out to you. Second thing is you can jump on a master class, which goes through about 90 minutes. A lot of these systems gives you a much better idea of how this all fits together. Either gets you really excited about it and you'll say, man, I wanna do this in my practice, or you'll say, uh, not my cup of tea, whatever. That helps you really figure out some of those components. So watch the masterclass. The link is, is at movableuniversity.com slash masterclass. Uh, check out the link I put on, on, on this Facebook post and you should be able to find all that stuff from that page. And then the third way to get started with this is maybe you've been following this stuff for a long period of time and you say, you know what, I, I'm just not sure. I have a couple of questions. Is this going to work for me? How do I get rolling? You can schedule a discovery call with, with our support team. It takes about five minutes. Within five minutes, you'll know, uh, he'll, he will know if this is worth continuing talking about. He doesn't want to waste your time. He doesn't want to waste his time. I don't want to waste his time because I got a lot of work for him to do. We're constantly doing stuff with Moveable University. This is a a full time, full, full, full time thing. There's so much that we have developed and we are developing. We're super excited about it, and um, we're just excited to share this with all of our chiropractic brothers and sisters. So it's been really awesome. Now back to the technique Thursday thing. Anterior hip pain. It's pinching. It's pinching to my hip. Okay. This is a common, common thing that people present with. And I had this patient today, she just started exercising more than she ever has before. She was fairly sedentary, young, young gal, early 20s. And she said, hey, I went from zero doing nothing to now walking and running six days a week. And I have anterior hip pain. She points right up into kind of groin region, anterior hip. So what's the thought process with that? Well, we do some orthopedic tests. So we do Faber, Faber, however you want to say it. Uh, you can do a scouring test, and you're looking to see can you represent or get, get, sorry, can you reproduce the pain with a certain motion? And when you do a scouring test, like around the world, and you're doing compression down the shaft of the femur, and she goes into flexion, and really flexion and adduction um, causes the same pinch. So what is that telling us? Well, it's telling us that the front of the femur is pounding into the front of the acetabulum. So we have her x-rays, we can look at her x-rays and we see is there something weird shaped in the acetabulum from that x-ray. Don't really see anything funky, there's no cam cam type of, uh, of malformation of the femur head, you know, being non-circular, non-spherical. Non um, so it doesn't look like it's a bony block. I can move her through that range of motion almost like she's doing a squat laying on her back face up and she can get into a full deep squat position so it's not blocking range of motion. So what's the thought process? The anterior rim of the acetabulum it has been irritated. Why does this happen? Why is this common with an with a average sedentary person? Very common pattern. This is a movement, movement pattern dysfunction and it's a sequence of things. But here's the thought process. Here's how I explained it to her and then here's how we started showing her some correctives for this. So I'm, I'm obviously addressing what I find in her spine. I'm adjusting her. She doesn't have any fixation in her femoris tabular joint, so I'm not, I'm not adjusting that joint. Um, it doesn't need to be adjusted, but making sure that her spine is adjusted, uh, nerve supply going to that area is, is not going to have any sort of compromise or issue. So that's the chiropractic component. But here's the thought process. The femur migrates anteriorly and that's common when there is more, more tension or increased tone of musculature 
on one side of the joint versus the other. So what are we talking about here? You have hip flexors, you have hip extensors. You have hip flexors, such as everything on the front. So iliopsoas, iliacus, rectus femoris, TFL, um, all of that on the front is most people, it's overactive, adaptively shortened from sitting for prolonged periods. So meaning if you're in a shortened position with a muscle sitting in hip flexion, those muscles will adaptively shorten over time and they need to be released, toned down, and more importantly, the opposing musculature, which is primarily the glute, glute max and glute medius, the posterior musculature is likely underactive and this can be from a couple reasons. One is because a lot of people have underactive glutes. You're, you're almost never going to see an overactive glute max. So a lot of people have underactive glutes because they're not using them. They're not extending their hip with their glute. But instead, it's a sequence of what happens that causes a loss of joint centration. And joint centration is when you know acetabulum femur sits right in the middle instead of to the front rarely to the back, but it migrates to the front. And so now when you go into hip flexion, like repetitive walking or squatting, the front of the femur butts into the front of the acetabulum, you have impingement, it irritates the cartilage and then it starts to hurt, okay? So now the thought process continuing. If you have overactive hip flexors, all right, that will cause reciprocal inhibition. It will shut off the opposing joint action muscle, which are the hip extensors. It will, so it'll further shut down glute max and even glute medius, all right? So those muscles are now asleep at the wheel. They're not working properly, all right? That's not good. Furthermore, what's gonna happen is you're gonna have the smaller ancillary muscles that are not fantastic hip extensors, but they'll do the job, the really hip stabilizers, muscles like piriformis, and the deep hip stabilizers. Those muscles now become overactive synergists. So now those muscles become, come like ramped up, they become painful, oftentimes causing deep posterior hip pain, glute pain type thing. So now those muscles are overactive. Then what happens is the other overactive synergists that are trying to help with hip extension, they take over. So the hamstring can take over and the erector spinae muscles can take over. And so there's a multitude of things that happen. So again, it's overactive hip flexors, reciprocally inhibits glutes. The, the overactive synergist for hip extension, which the glutes should be doing the job, but instead it, now you have piriformis and deep hip stabilizers being overly active, toned up like crazy causing pain, dysfunction. Then in, in addition to that, you have the muscles above and below the, below the hamstring and then above the erector spinae muscles becoming overactive, which will propel the leg into extension when you walk or run instead of the hip actually going into extension. Okay, so hopefully all that made sense so far. So now, what do you do in order of operation from a functional anatomy standpoint to fix this? because you don't just wanna jump into glute activation right away because it won't be all that helpful. You don't wanna just dig on muscles and stretch, stretch muscles all day long either, not gonna be helpful. So what do you do? You follow the sequence and the sequence is you first wanna mobilize what's overly toned, like overly toned up like crazy, you wanna mobilize. Then you wanna stabilize or activate the muscles that are not active, then you wanna put the person through a functional movement to repattern the movement and get the muscle that you just woke up and activated to actually fire in a movement pattern. So what does that look like? What types of exercises would you do for this person? What did we do with this gal today? What did we teach her? Well, this is like bread and butter stuff that all of you doctors need to be really understanding and our exercise staff understands this and these are common protocols that we do in the clinic all the time. I'm just pulling into my house here so now I can focus and I can talk into the camera. Give me just a second. Okay, cool. All right. All right. So here's what you do. Are you ready? Turn this off. <clears throat> okay, so here's what this looks like. 
you would want to do something like a global mobility thing to tone down muscle, like foam roll hip flexors. And then if the person could tolerate it, if it was needed, you could do like a double lacrosse ball hip flexor, J cane, like a theracane type thing into the hip flexor, inverted kettlebell, use the kettlebell horn to dig in the hip flexor, kind of tone it down a little bit. Usually a foam roller is sufficient, right? So that's the first thing you do. Then after you've done that, then you want to tone down the overactive synergists around the hip, which would be like piriformis. So you can do a, a double lacrosse ball type thing in the piriformis. You could foam roll but usually lacrosse ball, get in there deeper. Okay, so now you've toned that down a little bit, right? So now you could tone down the erector spinae, tone down the hamstring. Then you want to go into a little bit of stretching. So now you're going to stretch the hip flexors. You can do like a marry me stretch or like a lunging type of stretch. You can do a figure four stretch for piriformis. Um, You can do basically like child's pose for erector spinae. Uh, You could do like a standing, and then you basically tilt the pelvis forward with the leg up on a ledge bent to really target the hamstring while the pelvis is in hip flexion. Okay, that's kind of a hard thing to describe, but just bear with me. I don't want to focus just on that protocol. And then, so so, so you basically tone down the stuff with a tool. You've stretched. Then what you're going to do is then go in and activate the muscle needs to be activated, which is glute. So now you're going to do some glute medius, glute, glute maximus activation. Um, so you do like a glute bridge, a single leg glute bridge, um, and, uh, you could do like sideline adduction and extension. Then after you've done that, then you can like do banded like crab walk type thing. So, I mean, this is a pretty, pretty good detailed process. Okay. That could take a few minutes. Then from there, you'd want to do something to activate the glutes and pattern the process. So, Let's assume the patient already knows how to hip hinge. You could do like a banded deadlift. You could do a kettlebell deadlift and really emphasize squeezing the glutes at the top, the body forming a straight line at the top of the movement out of the deadlift. Those are all things that you'd want to do in that sequence, in that order to really start to get things kicked in again for a anteriorly migrated uh, femoral head in the acetabulum causing impingement in the front of the hip. Another thing you can do is like a banded pigeon where you take a big exercise band, put it in the front of the hip, have it pulling behind you, go into like a pigeon stretch type of position down on the ground, and that translates the head of the femur backwards while you're getting a good stretch into all the hip musculature. So all of that's done, that type of protocol, we teach that to the patient, we then have them work on that protocol at home. Um... That can take a good amount of time. That that could be like a 20-minute protocol, but that's done repetitiously until some of the toning down and 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 uh, really like the toning down protocols can be dialed back, and then the person can just do very little warm up, go straight into activation, and then go into the patterning movement, the functional exercise to reinforce the healthy pattern, like a deadlift, okay, um, or like a weighted a weighted glute bridge, like a hip thrust, a supine hip thrust. So anyway, that's what we did with this patient. That's the type of formula that we do as far as for a functional movement protocol. And it's fairly simple. It's a thought process. It's you think of, okay, why is the joint in an abnormal position creating pain or dysfunction? Okay. So it's migrated forward. What, what tissues are going to be toned up like crazy? Which ones are not going to be working? Okay. So tone those tissues down, make sure that you tone the other ones down on the other side of the joint that are the, the, the the overactive synergists, the small little movers that are trying to accomplish the same joint action but are not really the prime ones to do it. And a great analogy for that is is, uh, this is something I heard. I don't remember who said this. I don't know if it was Gray Cook or who said this exactly. But they said that when you're looking at a prime mover and you're looking at the overactive synergist, like the glute would be the prime mover for hip extension. That's like a CEO of a company. That's the most efficient person to do it. He gets the job done and he can do it long term. It's the CEO of the company. Then you have these tiny little muscles like piriformis and the hip stabilizers that can also cause hip extension. Those are like interns that you just hired. And there might be like three or four of them. And together they can get the job done, but they're not going to sustain the job very long. They're going to burn out and they're going to have all kinds of stress and, and, and issues if they're trying to do the job without the CEO taking charge perfect analogy because that's what happens like in this hip complex dysfunction but this thought process of you look at you look at what needs to be toned down what's the overactive synergist 
what muscle is reciprocally inhibited, how do you activate the muscle, and then how do you pattern that muscle and really the movement pattern. That's really what the functional movement part comes in to reinforce the healthy pattern. So that's what we did with her. That's the thought process that applies to the hip. It applies to rounded forward shoulders and problems with shoulder. Uh, applies to neck, forward head translation in the neck. It applies to uh, loss of ankle dorsiflexion. It applies to valgus knee collapse. Um, it applies to uh, loss of thoracic mobility. I mean, really, it might sound like it's a complex thing, but when, when you learn these main patterns throughout the body, and we teach this all inside of Movoy University and put it together in a really easy to follow way, and, and this is what our protocols revolve around, the fascinating thing is a lot of people are not teaching this. They're not doing this with their patients or their clients or their athletes, depending on what setting they're in. And this is the stuff that fixes people. And it's like, this is what I think us chiropractors should be showing people. We should be introducing this to them um, and doing this in conjunction with identifying postural issues, fixing their posture. And then, of course, fixing the segmental component is why we need to own the space because we're chiropractors. So anyway, all right. How's it going? We have... Gigi and Missy, how's it going, ladies? And whoever else is watching this that I don't have your name down below, thanks for watching. Have a great evening. Check out MoveOverUniversity.com if you're not familiar. Missy, I already know you are. But uh, if anyone's not familiar, check out MoveOverUniversity.com. Click on every single link on that page. There's lots of cool stuff on there. Over and out, let me know below real quick on a scale of 0 to 10. If you can let me know on the scale of 0 to 10, how, how interesting or how beneficial do you think this topic is? Okay how, how, uh, engaging is this? Is this something that you think is, is relevant on a scale of zero to 10? Give me a zero even, just give me something, but write something from zero to 10 and then tell me if there's a topic you want to see more about. So I know what to talk about and what everyone wants to see. And we talk about everything from functional movement protocols to clinical, to patient engagement, to handling objections, to stuff in the practice, to everything. So we got it covered. All right. Have a great night, everyone. We'll talk to you soon.